Hey everybody, welcome to the Ethics Experts. If it's your first time joining us, welcome. And if you're a returning subscriber, hey bestie, hope you're having an amazing day. See what happens when you subscribe to the Ethics Experts, you get a bonus greeting on every single episode. On this episode, we're talking with Tarek at Circle, and he is an expert on customized employee communication. So much of our employee engagement comes from the experience that they live out every day in our organization. And he has some really great tips on how to uh, customize that communication a little bit better. Stay tuned, let's learn. Welcome to the Ethics Experts, where we're elevating ethics and compliance and HR to the strategic level it's supposed to be. So you run, your company's called Circle. Correct. Yes, that's and, right. And you've been kind of described to me as a kind of a, an employee engagement expert. And I was excited to get you on uh, the ethics experts because, you know, a lot of the people that we talk to, you know, we're talking about our workplaces. How, how can we make our workplaces more ethical? And I think that is like a close cousin, or maybe it's a, you know, it's like an, it's a critical imperative for that engagement uh, at the employee level. We live in a knowledge work economy. Uh, people are their work. These divisions that used to exist between home life and work life, all those things are gone. I'm sure I'm speaking your language, but I just see so many organizations either on like a macro level, or I see leaders on a sort of a micro level really struggle with that engagement piece because it's not like you can flip a switch. It's more like stoking a fire. You know what I'm saying? It's like this reaction all the time. And it's, yes. it's hard to maintain because it's it's like a weather pattern that's changing, you know? Uh, I agree. I liken it to health. You can't just snap your fingers and be healthy. It's right. just got to be part of your DNA. It's got to be part of your lifestyle. It needs to be walking and breathing. That's just how we are. We just think healthy and engagement is exactly the same way. It just needs to be part of your culture. It's not as though you turn it on, turn it off. Mm -mm. It doesn't work that it doesn't work like that. So where did your passion for this come from? I mean, to be running a company on this particular niche, which I think is a super critical point of leverage. Um, you know, how did you get how did you get to where you're at? Uh, great question. It uh, it actually started with my kids. They're much older now, but uh, when they were, I guess, elementary school, middle school, I joined the school board. My background is technology. I'm a software engineer, but I love education. It's a great equalizer. So if I can volunteer and give back and help in any way, I will always say yes. So I joined the school board and quickly I realized that they struggle with too much communication and it's falling on deaf ears and it's not relevant. And how do we get more people in and engaged with our kids' futures in education. So once I realized that this was happening, uh, you know, my career has been based on finding interesting problems. I never think about money. I never think about building a business. I think about how could we use technology to make the world a better place? And this specific use case was, could we use technology to drive engagement between parents, alumni, community members, and what's going on in these schools to deliver better educational outcomes for these kids. And I don't know, Nick, what it was like when you were growing up, but I remember field trips, assemblies, guest speakers, and you never know when one of those moments will drastically change the trajectory of one of those kids. So that's what I was thinking of. How do we get more of that in schools? And then that led me to really analyze what's winning the engagement battle. And that is, none of these will be a surprise. Amazon, Netflix, Hulu, Spotify. So I thought, what are they doing that's similar? And what they do that's similar is they make you feel as though Nick is the only shopper, viewer, subscriber, reader that we have. Everything is tailored to you. Where does that come from? There is a war on people's time. Whether we know it or not might be subconscious for you, but if you think about what you really value in your life, they're all things that save you time. Airbnb, Uber, Netflix, they're all time savers. Taxi, Blockbuster, hotels, come on. We don't have right. time for this anymore. And right. so all of these things are congealing into, uh, it's a phrase that I'm stealing, and I don't remember who quoted it, 
but or coined it, we're not in the information age. We are in the attention age. Yeah. I believe that to be true. A hundred percent. And that's a great word I use as well. Currency. That, anyway, that's where it all came from. So you had this, you saw this problem. This is sort of an engagement problem. It's sort of a lack of tailoring problem and uh, less than ideal kind of outcomes in the educational space. And then at some point you started looking kind of at businesses and at some point you said, okay, whatever, you know, this problem exists, not just in the school, you know, the school realm, it exists kind of everywhere. So how did that pivot happen? And what did you learn in that sort of discovery phase when you're like, what is this problem? How are other kind of entities sort of solving this problem? Tell me about that pivot into the workplace. I would love to tell you, Nick, that uh, this was the plan all along. <laughs> that would be a big, fat lie. So I'm building this nights and weekends to solve this one specific use case. And once I built this technology, this is, I don't know, nine years ago, all based on machine learning and AI. I can't think of another way that we can actually scale engagement without these two technologies. So I build it, I roll it out, I give it away. Any school district that wants to use this, it's free to you. So what happened is a lot of companies started coming to me and saying, could we use this for marketing? Could we tailor what our marketing list is getting? Why are we trying to decide what the newsletter should be for our audience? Why isn't it tailored to them? I said, wow, that's a really good use case. Sure, use it. So then what happened was a large healthcare organization here in Cincinnati came to me and said, we're receiving all of this really tailored communication. We love it. Could we use this same technology with our employees? Could we tailor what each person's getting based on what they need to see and want to see? I said, I have no idea. I don't know anything about internal communication. I don't know anything about employee experience. How do you do it today? And they said, we use Outlook and SharePoint, yep. which blew my mind because that was, has, it's been the answer for 15 years. Yeah, exactly. 100%. 96. That's a way better way to say it. It's so 96. So it shocked me that the advancements in experience that we've seen on the consumer side, the marketing side, have not translated to the employee side. Right. And so I said, great, let's roll this out. So we tried it with this healthcare organization, 10,000 employees. It was such a huge hit. It massively spiked engagement and it stayed up. It wasn't just a spike, elevated engagement. And they were so shocked by this, like the power of personalization. I invited them to speak in an internal communications conference in New Orleans, and I'll never forget it. And here's why. There's this little 10,000 person regional healthcare organization on stage. And in the audience is Citibank, L'Oreal, Nike, Delta, uh, you name it, some of the biggest yeah. brands in the world. And they're all wowed. How did you figure this out? They wouldn't let her get off the stage. It was. So many so many questions. And I'm thinking, how is it that these companies with all these resources and all these employees are still communicating like 96? Because they hadn't put two and two together. What we're doing for the consumer hasn't translated. So that was kind of the pivot point. When I saw their hunger, how did you do this? I was like, that. That is who our customer should be. That is our market. We are going to modernize the employee experience. And we want it to be the same as the consumer experience. So what was that, that person that was on stage uh, speaking? Like, what were they saying that was so resonant with the audience? What, you know, why wouldn't they let her get off, off stage? What was it sort of specifically that yeah. she was saying in terms of like engagement KPIs or something moving that people were like, oh my gosh, what the heck is happening? Yeah. So they have really hard, you know, healthcare is really hard to reach audience. You've got deskless workers, you've got 24 hour operations, you've got people with patients, nurses, you've mm -hmm. got doctors that need specific information. You've got facilities that doesn't care anything cool. about medicine, but they care about what's going on with whatever. How in the world do you engage such a diverse audience? 
And so with, you know, how we have structured this, it is tailored. It's not even a persona. It is you, you as a neurosurgeon, you need to know X, Y, and Z. And you haven't seen it yet anywhere else. Great. Those are your lead stories. By the way, we've also learned what you like. You're into community service and innovation. These are not need to know pieces of content, but you want to know them based on you as a human being. And so think 10,000 employees, there's not one newsletter, there's 10,000 unique newsletters, 10,000 unique experiences when they go to the internet, it's tailored to you. When they go to Teams, tailored to you. When they get their newsletter, tailored to you. If you missed something, I remember uh, my employer saying something about tuition reimbursement didn't matter to me nine months ago. But I'm thinking about going back to school now. Tailored to you. There's a microsite that is built for every single employee. So you can go back and search. Show me everything across all channels having to do with tuition reimbursement or COVID-19 or innovation or health and wellness. I mean, it is down to the individual in the same way Netflix is all about you. That's the experience that we all long for. And I think where we're headed is this will not be optional. As you get younger and younger employees into the workforce, they don't know 96. They don't understand this idea of communicating with just email or forcing people to go to an internet that looks like it was built on a Craigslist UI. They don't get this, right? So it's not optional. If you really want to engage that- It's table stakes. You, this, yeah, exactly. This is basic blocking and tackling that organizations should be offering to their. So, I mean, my organization is guilty of what I'm about to say, but it's, <laughs> it's a little, um, I'm just being honest. Uh, it's a little odd that there's so much effort placed on, you know, how the front yard looks, what I'll say the front of the house needs to look so nice, you know, that, you know, so much money is spent in business on that curb appeal and not a lot is spent a lot of, not a lot of focus is spent on like how does the vibe inside the house feel mm -hmm. and at some level you know i've always said that like your external brand and your internal brand those are really two sides of the same coin they they are the same thing um and i think employees who are inside the fold who are inside you know inside the wall um they can see sort of like glaring discrepancies between these two brands, but it is truly one brand. You know, your brand is just your reputation. Your brand is just what someone can come to expect from you. And we try to affect that brand in the marketplace in the minds of people that we don't know that we want to be customers with nice marketing and all the flashy things and all the personalized, you know, like you said, like the personalized, you know, outreach and stuff like that. And the, there's not that same wrong word, perhaps, but maybe dramatic, like there's not that same sort of respect to give into these other stakeholders that are arguably more important because they're already part of it. They're arguably they're arguably more important because like you're not going to have a business without employees. You know, no one's going to love your organization if your organization is not full of people who love it first. You know what I'm saying? So like there's this, you know, as as transparency has become more a thing, as there's more a uh, more opportunities for employees to voice their concerns on social social media and so forth, this gap or the the thickness of the wall between the external brand and the internal brand has all but collapsed. You know what I'm saying? It's it's one yes. sort of thin membrane now. And I think a lot of organizations, you know, I'm sure that that this thing was so resonant because it's a it's a it's a problem that I think a lot of people sort of intellectually recognize, but they don't know how to like bring it down to to earth and make those connection points on the employee side so that there's more of a you know, there's more sort of consistency in terms of the external brand experience and the internal brand experience. Uh, I mean, you're, you're singing my song, my friend. That is exactly right. When, when I get into kind of these thought exercises around what drives real value, there's a couple of options, right? So it's your product or service, what you're selling, is your customers, or it's your people. And I think his, it's called the Employee Experience Advantage. I think it's Jacob Morgan. I want to say his name is the author. So he did an analytical study of hundreds of companies around their employee experience. And he found that companies that 
really value employee experience, they're outperforming their competition. It's like four to one. They make more revenue. They grow faster. They have better profits. They retain talent longer. So there's real value there. Everything that you're doing is based on how do you treat your people? And so I agree, you know, it's, it's who, what you do is who you are. How you behave is who you actually are. You can say from a marketing, branding perspective, try to give off this image. And then if that isn't actually what you do internally, it's hollow and people see through that. Yeah. And, you know, what I found, what I found in my own life and in my own, you know, business is that there is this natural sort of like human desire to put out a facade that you have it all together and you have all the answers, especially like as you get into more of a leadership position. Um, But I have found that, like, obviously nobody's perfect. And I've just found that, like, the people that I work with seem to have a lot more grace for our organization when we're transparent about what problem we're having, how we're trying to figure it out, the fact that we don't have all the answers, but that together we can all figure it out. Like there's so much more grace for discrepancies between the ideal that is sort of purported or like pushed out there in terms of like, these are our values and the actual values that people are living out, right? I mean, I talk about this all the time. There's this like ideal culture, these words on the wall, this ideal experience that we wanna push out there because these are kind of aspirational. And then there's something, there's some reality that falls short of that at all times, like there's always a gap between the perfection and and the reality. And so I think a lot of leaders are scared to acknowledge that gap because that gap is sort of an admission of like something less than perfection or something less than than the ideal. But I've just found that like most people are pretty common sense and they understand that there's always going to be a gap between sort of perfection and reality. And I think what they're looking for is really just like a, uh, you know, maybe like a transparent acknowledgement of that gap and, you know, credible efforts uh, to try to close that gap. You know what I mean? A hundred percent. It's paradoxical. It's, it's almost like the more real you are, the more grace you end up getting, the more fake you are, you know, the more concerned you have to be with like a foot fault that can, you know, knock the whole ho- house of cards over or something. You know what I mean? I do. I think, um, where we see this really, uh, catch hold is when, I don't have to tell you, I don't have to sell you that your employees are important. Right. They already believe this. It's the same thing. If I go back to where we started the conversation, you think about health, right? If if I've got to convince Nick that uh, staying healthy is going to be good for your longevity, and I've got to sell you on this because you're on a 24 hour Twinkie fast kind of thing. Right. This is a huge problem where it's really effective is you already believe this and you're looking for ways to do it better. Yeah. You're already in this mindset. And that's what we've seen with our customers is nine times out of 10, they come to us and they're saying, we've heard of you. We, we believe this is the right thing to do. Show us what the future could look like. And those are my favorite conversations. So I'm a technologist. I'm not a salesperson. I love that because it really is an empathy-driven philosophy. Yeah, and These it's also like have a problem-solving philosophy. Yeah, they know they can be better, right. right? They're always saying, we could be better. It's not ego standing in the way of we're the best. We've already got it figured out. No one can right. tell us how to do it better. It is... Show me a better way because we believe we should always be thinking about how to improve in this area of our business. So, you know, you mentioned Netflix before and Netflix works because it knows your preferences, right? It Mm -hmm. knows which videos I watch, which ones I thumbs down, whatever. How do you get that sort of like granular, you know, identifying, you know, data around employees in order to inform the configuration or the permutation of the newsletter that is, you know, unique to them? Yeah. So we go, I mean, it's way beyond a newsletter. It's everywhere you go in that organization, there's a personalized news feed created for you in real time. Just like it doesn't matter where you log into Netflix, phone, TV, laptop, the channel is irrelevant. The experience is what counts. So when it gets there, so if you switch from your laptop to your phone, 
or your phone from your TV. Netflix doesn't care. It's saying Nick's back. Where, what, where did he leave off? What do we know now about his behavior and his likes and his dislikes? And then it creates that experience for you in real time. We're doing the exact same thing on the employee side, wherever they go, tailored to you. And how it learns is twofold. One is you can tell it. I really care about volunteering or community service or whatever it is. The other is it's going to learn based on your behavior. So let's say uh, within your organization, there's a message from the CEO. There's open enrollment that starts September 1st, and you've got a new leadership hire. Nick, I don't care what your interests are. You need to know these three things, right? So that's where the organization is control, and it's also where it differs greatly from marketing. Who cares that Nick didn't see that there was a 25% off sale this weekend? That's marketing. No one's going to die or lose their job, get in trouble. Yeah, they didn't know that. yeah. right. So this is where this internal communication function, I think, is infinitely more complex than marketing because of this wrinkle. You must know X, Y, and Z. And that could be based on all employees in North America, all employees at a certain level, all employees right. that were hired in the last 90 days, whatever it is. So we can be very granular about how we target and okay. make sure you're getting the information you need to know. That's first. The second, when we deliver an experience, is recommended for you. This is all based on either what you've told it, just like Netflix when you first log in. It says, hey, what kinds of shows and movies do you like, Nick? You're like, I like um, black and white subtitled Italian dramas because you want Netflix to think you're cultured. That's what you told it. Your yeah. behavior is you're watching Tommy. Adam Boy. Sandler movies. That's right. Yeah. And so <laughs> Netflix quickly realizes every time I make one of these really cultured recommendations, Nick ignores it. He's all about Adam Sandler, Chris Farley, whatever it is, Step Brothers. Okay. It knows who you are based on how you behave. We do the same thing. Argue is also culture. You could argue that that's maybe even higher culture in some ways. Uh, I, I would, I, me personally, yes, I would thousand percent agree with that, but that's how it's learning everywhere you go. It's saying, Hey man, it's these things are required. What you're doing. It's pushing something out that it thinks you like. If you don't actually like it based on your behavior, then it notes that and continues with the algo. Yeah. 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 So for example, let's say, I don't know, there's six pieces of content that it's found that match your interests. And when we deliver an experience, it would even tell you this is an 82% match based on your behavior and what you've told us. So it, that's how it's ranking this want to know information. It was just constantly learning over time. And if your interests change, you don't even have to tell it. Just like Netflix, you don't have to tell it. It's going to learn. It yeah, he doesn't really care about community service anymore. He's really more interested in innovation or health and wellness. Maybe you're on a big health kick. It's January, New Year's resolution. Wow, he's consuming everything to do with health and wellness. Good. That'll be higher priority for you. And so as the comms team is putting out sort of pieces of content, they're just tagging it with some kind of identifier so that the program can kind of grab these pieces of content and attach it on an individual basis. Is that sort of how it's? Yeah. If they have a taxonomy, most organizations do. They have a taxonomy that they've developed for their intranet. So they've got different categories that this piece of content could fall into. They're going to tag it in certain ways. But there's also AI that's reading this and saying, you don't have to tag it. We're going to figure out what this oh, is about nice. and match it based on behavior regardless. So if they want to because they want to be within the confines of their taxonomy. They can. If not, the system will do it for them. So what, what message do you think this sends to an employee who goes from kind of the 1996 SharePoint methodology, SharePoint Outlook combo? to something that's that's more more tailored. Because I would imagine that there's a message being communicated, not just whatever they're seeing on the screen, but there's also a message in terms of like the company's dedication to their experience or something. Like I'm just trying to kind of deconstruct the impact that this has on the employee, you know, experience, their engagement, and all that. Uh, that's a great question. Nobody's ever asked me that question. I think it is more subconscious than anything. Because I the agree. employee we're not changing the channels. It's still SharePoint. It's still a newsletter. It's still email, Teams, mobile, whatever it is. 
they don't know that we exist and that's how we want it. Yeah. All they know is that their experience got better. All they know and feel is that this company cares about my time and they're surfacing things that matter to me. And maybe the smart companies that we work with announce this. Hey, we yeah, right. made an investment in this technology because we care about you uh, as an employee and we want to unearth and save you time and find the things that matter to you because you as a human matter to us. That's what the smart companies do. But from an employee experience perspective, they don't know why it feels different. It will just feel very different. And then when, uh, you know, I'm sure you now have, you know, you've moved into, you know, the corporate space now. What are some of the, what are some of the stories that you hear from clients once they kind of get up their J curve? Because I'm sure there's like an implementation and they're starting to, you know, they have to kind of, they, they have to digest this, this thing and kind of implement it into their apparatus. But once kind of those wheels catch, what is it like, what does it look like? What do they start to see? What, what's, what's changing, you know? Uh, there's really two big perspectives where you see change. One is from the communications team itself. So the old way is we got to go and put the same content across each channel. They don't have to do that anymore. They just hit publish one time. We become the traffic cop. When someone comes to that channel, we deliver that experience. So as a communicator, I don't have I have less work to do in terms of feeding channels. I can spend more of that time being creative. They get analytics. Hey, do you know your workforce really loves employee spotlights and you're not producing enough content to keep up with demand of what they like? So stop guessing. So we give you real-time analytics across channels. That's probably one of the biggest things we see across companies of all size is they don't have the same level of understanding that marketing does, right? They can say, this is where Nick is in the buying journey. He's consumed whatever. We don't do that with employees. We don't do that internally. They're not looking in aggregate as to what type of content, long form, short form, video, what channels, all of it. So just having more data to make better decisions, that's a big one. This is just with the comms team. Then with the employees themselves, we see the increased productivity. I'm not seeing content. I just saw this. Why are you sending me an email about something I've already engaged with? We see right. increased engagement because when they receive communication, it's tailored to them. The subject line is tailored to you. The lead story, you're always getting fresh, relevant content, hyper-targeted to just you. So we see massive jumps in engagement across channel because everywhere they go, tailored. Those are probably the biggest um, outputs yeah. Yeah, once yeah. we launch. Yeah. I mean, it's such a tough thing, you know, because I think, um, you know, our HR team kind of deals with this as well. Like, I think they put a lot of thought into trying to make sure that the comms they send around are thoughtful and they're not overloading people and they're not you know, not annoying people, but at the same time, it's like, I need confirmation that this, you know, that this message is delivered and stuff like that. So it's a really hard thing to balance, you know, um, when, and then like, when you miss it, like you can never kind of get it right because some people are like, feel uninformed. And then other people are like, why do you keep emailing me this? It, do I work for a company of idiots? Like that happens yes. on a subjective level that, that kind of erodes <laughs> people's connection to their company. I mean, it just does. Um, but like, let's say somebody is like, let's say, you know, the average company is laying down and your solution is someone running or sprinting. If somebody is at a smaller company or they don't have the budget or something, what kind of crawl or walk type steps could they make in the absence of an AI tool like yours to start addressing this in some kind of a way? Yeah. So how we think about it is uh, first kind of targeting to even have the capacity to target and segment your people. That's going to be light years ahead of kind of everything goes to everyone because people just tune out if that's how you're communicating today. If everything is in the inbox, which is the most congested channel of all time, in your yeah. inbox. Fantasy football is in your inbox. You, you know, golf this Sunday is in your inbox. Your mom is in your inbox. And so is your CEO. And so is your chief people officer. And so is this thing that you must do. Right. 
It's way too much noise. So if that's how you're communicating today, of course you're going to have low engagement because you're competing. Yeah, things get lost. It's a battle that you can't rise above. You know, it's too loud. That's right. Yeah. So we think about one segmentation. We built that into broadcast is kind of what we have in market today. So that's the name of Circle Broadcast. That's the base layer. Is why do you need to go to HR to pull this data? Why are you asking for spreadsheets? Why are you going to IT to build distribution lists? You you're the communicator. You should be doing this on your own without handcuffs. I don't know how they got through COVID. You imagine this submitting tickets nonstop. I need a list of everybody that works at this plant second shift because we've got an outbreak. That doesn't exist. IT is not going to prepare that list. Wait for them to do it. Double check it. Then you can hit send. What? So yeah, you and think then about turned over, and then it's not a complete list. I mean, it's a thousand, you yeah. know, issues. Yeah, yeah. And this is how almost every company operates today. So I think about number one is just the basics. Can you segment and target? Even if you have to go through IT and HR, great. The next level up, the next phase of evolution is you do this yourself. I don't need them. We're sitting on top of all your people data. I decide I want to send something to all employees hired in these four states in the last 90 days. You don't need anyone. You should be able to do all of this yourself. Great. Then it's email. I get it. Every company sends email, but you have to have analytics. I mean, this is not optional. I just yeah, talked how to many a company. Are clicked? How many are getting opened? Like, do you know how the subject lines are working? I mean, it's crazy. There's this muscle built on the outward piece where there's mad, like there's mad analytics around A-B testing between all these little factors in an email because their currency is engagement. But to your point, Internally, it's engagement as well. And there's not that same sort of lens. There's not that same sort of, uh, you know, analytical rigor around optimizing internally as there is out, you know, external. Yeah, 100%. You have to be able to answer these questions. So we think that obviously the next step is we know you're sending email that will never stop. You need to know how they're performing. You need to know, like, were they even delivered? I mean, this is critical, and most companies can't even answer this question. They just hit send and hope. And when someone comes back and says, I never got it, there's no way for them to check. See, yes, you did. Nick, I see you got it. Monday, 807, you opened it. As a matter of fact, you click the link, whatever. Correct. It looks like you looked at it on your phone. Whatever. Yeah. So when you think about compliance, when you think about making sure everyone is included in receiving messages, my gosh, that's, this is, again, foundational. You have yeah. to have analytics. Great. The next piece would be, oh, we've got multiple channels to communicate to our folks. Slack, Teams, intranets, newsletters, mobile app, digital signage, you name it. And what we've seen is every time they add a channel, they're creating what I've heard coined by someone else, channel anxiety. I, as an employee, have to go everywhere to make sure I'm not missing it's crazy. one thing. I'm it is crazy. But that's how these companies, every company almost, operates. And so how do you unify that into one experience? How do we make the channel agnostic to the experience? Netflix does not care where you consume it. Why are we forcing employees to Teams, intranet, email? Let them go wherever they would like. Yeah and deliver a tailored experience for them. That's that's kind of where you want to get to, but it is definitely, and this is what we do with our customers too, is it's crawl, walk, run. We'll get you there. And it's going to be a process and it will be a matter of, it's not years, it's months, but we don't recommend starting with Omnichannel. Yeah, and you know, there's always more you can do. There's always more customization you can do. It's like this, you know, it's like this ideal that you can continue to strive uh, toward probably forever. And I just think it's, I think what you said is important that like, just cause you're not going to sort of teleport to the promised land doesn't mean you shouldn't start that kind of journey because the incremental moves are going to have an impact. You know, um, you know, we talk to a lot of ethics, compliance, human resource, employee engagement folks, um, and particularly around the like code of conduct or like the policy set issue, they run into a similar type of a thing 
because let's just kind of talk about a compliance person. They have to make sure that all the policies are dialed in across the organization. And many times they have mixed, uh, you know, workers and, you know, manufacturing, office workers, people on the road, whatever. And so they have to, you know, understand this whole umbrella. But I think they sometimes lose some engagement and some credibility with the workforce when, you know, again, imagine you're, you know, seeing a policy book where 50% of the policies don't even apply to you. It's yes. Like, I don't need to, con you know, why do I need to read a policy about the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act when I'm pulling a lever on a on a manufacturing <laughs> machine? You know what I'm saying? So like, I do. And then that same problem happens on the compliance side because then they start to lose lose credibility. Uh, the information is not delivered in sort of a tailored way. So there are some innovations happening. And again, this is, you know, everyone's kind of, you know, whittling away at their own sticks in their own corners of the forest, you know, like the innovations that are happening there are, uh, a policy written in, th you know, three different ways, a too long, didn't read at the top, a couple of bullets here, and then sort of, the, you know, an easy to read kind of fifth grade level, and then perhaps the full, you know, legalese below it. But how much better even could that be if these policy books were sort of parsed out and sort of sent only to, you know, you only have to look at like what's germane to your business. And many of those things are going to be sort of tied to the job description that that person has. So I'm just saying that that that's a perhaps type of an example of uh, you know, a little intentionality on the front end before these before these communications are sort of distributed, whether it's a policy or if it's a newsletter or whatever, and making just doing a little bit of extra thought and, say, and maybe you send out three policy emails instead of the one, you know, the single monolith where you're dropping a phone book on somebody's desk. You know, yes. but like little things like that, I think, can be a, you know, a baby step toward kind of a fully, you know, fully customized employee experience that feels very custom and feels very bespoke, you know? Well, I think, I think it, it's a really interesting time as these things are now converging. Right. So what you've got is you've got uh, really modern ways to deliver an experience. That's, that's what we do. We think ourselves uh, as the pipes within an organization to deliver an amazing experience. An amazing experience. So take Netflix. Let's go back to that. Great apps, distribution. All of it is fantastic. But if the content stinks, Netflix will be out of business. If they are, you log into Netflix yeah, and it's the point. same 10 things and they're making everybody pick, hey, it's horror movie day. Nick hates horror movies. I'm out. What are you doing? Or I switch from phone to TV and I have to start all over. You don't remember where I left off? I'm out, right? So, or the movies stink. They just give you horrible content. I'm out. So it is the convergence of great distribution and great content. So how do we free up the communicator to deliver more creative, valuable content? We have to have the analytics and they have to have the time. Great Those point. two things go together. Then, I'm proud of that. That's profound. Yeah. All right. I'm not sure. Uh, I feel like my week is good. Someone good. said can, something about it. I'll take it. Um, <laughs> Where we are going now is you take this idea of distribution and you marry it with uh, generative AI. So this exact example that you gave, I love so much is, okay, here is the full policy. Now I want a version that I want this to be rewritten at a fifth grade level so I can review it. They need to review everything, of course. Great. Boom. This is a second. Now it's done and you have it. Yeah. Now, if you have targeting, you can say, I want this version to go to this part of my workforce. I want and how this about I have a nice example of this policy specific for the manufacturing people or specific for the healthcare people or specific yeah. for the sales people, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. You really want digestion. You have to give them content that they can absorb. Right. The channel should be irrelevant. Great. We can handle all of that. I think when you start marrying these technologies, the, the future of employee experience, employee engagement is the combination of these two techs meeting. That is powerful. The two techs being the, the marriage of uh, distribution and content with the generative AI. Great content with great distribution. Yes. Got you. Got you. Got you. Um, so where do you, you know, let's say it's 10 years from now, where do you mm -hmm. think, like, what do you think the employee experience looks like? How do you think that that's changed? I know that's a probably a kind of a hard question. 
But do you think it'll be like a lot more consistent? Do you think there will be a bigger separation between companies who get it and companies who don't? Like, do you think it'll just be kind of uh, an average rising of the tide? And, you know, we'll look back and say, wow, I can't believe, you know, what the employee experience was like 50 years ago. What do you think? Yeah, yeah. I think 10 years feels like so far away with the way technology is accelerating and advancing. I think 10, 10 years from now will not be optional. I think 10 years from now, you know, this is probably whatever, 1985 or 1990 and someone saying, what does the workplace look like in 2000? 2000 right? Everybody's sending email. You know, back in the day, they would pass around an envelope that you had to sign to say, I read this memo. It's insane, but that's how we used to work. And so, okay, everybody's going to be sending email. I think everyone will be communicating this way. And whether the company believes in it or not, they will have to to keep up with their competition because you will lose talent at alarming rates because they don't want to walk into 1996. Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, it's a crazy time. It just feels like we're at such a such a pivot point in this whole game, this employee experience game and our, you know, the state of our workplace game. You know, there have been so many changes over the last, I don't know, call it five to 10 years that re this really does seem like a focal point or like, you know, a precipice. Um, and there's just so many, so many different dynamics that weren't a reality 10 years ago. Like the ease of changing jobs is higher than it's ever been. Labor mobility is higher than it's ever been. So to your point, the cost of changing a job is way lower or, you know, organizations have been conditioned to see 20 different experiences on a, on a resume. And that's not the that's not the scarlet letter that it used to be, you know, in our parents generation or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, you know. But it's I guess it's like everything, you know, some people overcorrect or some people move too late, um, but it's absolutely moving. Like we're definitely just not in a state of stasis by any means, you know. Yeah, yeah, and I, I I see it from a macro level as COVID was a massive yeah. accelerant to mm -hmm. thinking kind of the future of work, how, how all these companies were more productive when people were working from home. So that myth is gone. It's been debunked. All right, so cool. We need to have really cool tech, easy to use tech, stable tech, uh, because they, people can work from anywhere. And we know that to be true. And that genie's not going back in the bottle. So you've got that. You've got the emergence of um, Gen AI. I think that is massive and is going to make a big difference on employee experience. And then, you know, really when you think about kind of the last piece, I think about the changing demographic of people entering your workforce that don't know anything else. That's right. just what they expect. Right. And so it's so big. I mean, because all the other apps, all the other interaction points, to your point, have a level of customization that now is sort of almost turning into table stakes. Yeah. So I think it's really kind of those three things have hyper accelerated. Where I don't think this is going to be 10 years out. I think the laggards, like if you haven't adopted this in 10 years, you might not be in business. I think it's going to be that important to the future success of these organizations. Where do uh, where where can people learn some more about you? Uh, well, if you go to our website, C E R K L. I know I'm not a marketer. I was looking for a cool like domain it. circle, uh, and really, you know what? Um, because it's based on AI and machine learning, where I was going with that was machine learning is a feedback. Loop. Right. Train it. So that was the idea of circle. Uh, right. Communication circle. Exactly. And so that's where circle came from. CERKL.com. I'm on LinkedIn. I love engaging with people on the LinkedIn, as the kids like to say. So people have questions. Um, if they're starting a new role or they're in a new organization or they just want to lead with empathy and leave a mark on their organization. They want to make a change. Great. I can walk you through that. I can give you advice. I can help you. I can point you in different directions. So LinkedIn is probably a great place to initiate those conversations. Very good. It was, this was a lot of fun, man. I appreciate you joining us on the ethics experts and we'll see. Congrats you soon. on the new set. This is awesome. Thank you. Nick, it was great. Thank Glad you. to break it in with you, man. All oh right, my we'll God. It was awesome. Time.